Support Microbe TV. It's time for our annual fundraising drive. We depend on your support to produce high-quality science videos and podcasts. And now is the time to help us. If our programs have appealed to your science interests, or if they have helped you in some way, please record a brief audio or video with your phone and tell us about it. Let us know how we empower your inner scientist. We'll use it for our fundraising efforts. Send it to incubator at microbe.tv. And for more information on how you can give us your support, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1167, recorded on November 9th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, everybody, and hello particularly to Vincent, but also to everybody else. And uh, today is an unusual day. No, it's not an unusual day. It's an unusual fall. Today was like yesterday. Yesterday was like the day before that. Yesterday, no, no, no. We've had <laughs> three weeks of this remarkable weather and without a drop of rain. And I'm, I'm starting, I, mean, I have these um, websites that I go to look at the flow rates for the trout streams that I used to fish in. And they're all <laughs> below the 90% level of what they should be. Oh. That's that's 10% flow rate. Hmm. Now, the, the, thank God it's not hot so that the fish are still alive, but still it's uh, bizarre, bizarre. Yeah, right? here, here it's 20C. It's and sunny. It's bizarre. It's really amazing. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I think cooler weather may be coming your way because we <laughs> had some of that warm stuff too. And today it's 59 Fahrenheit, 14 Celsius. And it's going to be cooler tomorrow too. As you heard at the just before this episode began, we we're in our full fundraiser. And one of the things we'd like is for you to tell us all about how our shows appeal to your inner scientist. <laughs> Record a video or audio and send it to us and we'll make it part of our fundraising efforts. This morning we got our first video from the Potter family. No, not Harry. Kip, Laura, and Emma <laughs> from San Francisco. Thanks so much. And we're going to make little amalgams of these videos so that you can see them. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We'll also be adding... Interesting fundraising opportunities like, well, we have some autographed textbooks we're going to give away. We have some knit knitted caps. One of our listeners knitted some caps with um, uh, DNA on them. Shouldn't it be knitted capsules? <laughs> <laughs> we have, um, we can auction, you can visit the incubator. We'll auction off a visit to the incubator. We'll auction off you sitting in on an episode like this and listening in to it being recorded. So lots of fun things. But most important, you know, um, we we try and simplify science for everyone. I think that's more and more important these days, as everyone knows. I thought we, you were going to um, do this little interlude about uh, science and do your little thing. And I thought, oh, he's going to tell us to record uh, somebody to record and graph temperatures and send that in as their thing. <laughs> and then I thought you were going to go on to introduce our last person. Because you haven't done that yet. I didn't? No. And I didn't introduce Brianne? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. A woman who needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great to be here. It's 66 and sunny, which is at least cooler than a couple days ago when it was 80. Hmm. Um, but, yes, we do actually have uh, – we've been having a lot of forest fires in this area because it's been so long since we've had rain. Um, it's quite dry. Um and it is a very unusual Sorry fall. about that, Brianne. It is okay. We have a job announcement. Release the viral immunologist in you. That's because you were waiting to, for me to. <laughs> <laughs> the Rosenfeld Lab in the Division of Viral Products at Sieber FDA is looking for a postdoc or slash scientist, staff scientist, 
to continue the lab's research understanding the immune responses elicited during antivirus infection. If you are an immunologist wanting to learn virology, email Amy at amy.rosenfeld at fda.hhs.gov. Uh, Kathy, it looks like it's that time of year for ASV. Yes, indeed. ASV 2025 will be held in Montreal this year at the Palais de Congrès de Montreal. And uh, this was the one that was supposed to be in 2021. So we have been anticipating this one for a long time. It will be July 14th to 17th, 2025. And the website is asv.org slash asv2025. So you can go check that out. But the main reason I wanted to mention something today is because the timeline is very short for Global Scholar Travel Award applications. They have just uh, been opened and they will be accepted through November 30th. So this episode will come out uh, on the, what, 17th or something? And then uh, you don't have much time after that by the time you hear this. So uh, go to asv.org slash asv2025. And then on the top, you'll see a place where you can click on grants and awards. And then there's a drop down or you can scroll down to the Global Scholar Travel Awards application link. So check it out. Okay. I have just two news items for you. The first is a bioarchive. I saw a med archive preprint, Emergence of a Novel Reassortant, Clade 2.3.2.1c Avian Influenza A H5N1 virus associated with human cases in Cambodia. Uh, and this um, this is very interesting. This comes from the lab of Eric Carlson, who we talked with uh, in Australia at um, the School for Influenza, which preceded the Options 12 meeting. That will be released very soon, and uh, you know, this is one of the things that he does. He he looks for things, infectious diseases that, that are relevant to uh, Cambodia, because it's a, it's different down there than it is here. <clears throat> you know that, right? Anyway, so this it, <clears throat> there haven't been any human H five N one infections in ten years in Cambodia, and this year they had sixteen cases between February and August all caused by clay 2.3.2.1c viruses, and some of them had reassorted with different clades of H5N1. And so this is this paper describes those uh, isolates and basically says, you know, we need to be, be vigilant. Uh, you know, especially down there, there's a lot of poultry trade. Uh, and so Absolutely. that's the source of these uh, human infections. And so actually he works at the Pasteur of Cambodia. So Pasteur has many global campuses, and this is this one. And I said, why? Why do they exist? He said, well, <laughs> to deal with all the local infectious disease issues. You know, he said, we have we don't have to work on them, but we want to because they're important. He said, just, this is very interesting, just rice farming alone is associated with so many microbes. It's amazing, bacteria and viruses. And he said to, to me, is something interesting. Maybe Dixon, you can confirm this. He says, you don't need to flood rice fields, but it makes it easier to grow and harvest it if it's that flooded. That's right. That is right. Is that right? Yes, it is. Huh. In fact, you just reminded me when you said this was, they haven't had cases of H5N1 for 10 years. 10 years ago, now I know how many years ago it was, my wife and I were in Cambodia on tour uh, going through Angkor Wat and Angkor Tom. Uh, among other places. And we took a boat ride in some of these. Uh, and I have uh, some slides. I'll, I will send one to you. Maybe you can post it with this uh, episode. Um, they have a stencil that they mark the places where they have found H5N1 hmm. and with human cases. And that, that was 10 years ago. And where we got onto the boat, <laughs> there was a post with a stenciled H5N1, and what was it? Part of it? a skull and crossbones. Mm -hmm. So someone, someone had there. someone had died from H5N1. Yeah, it's too bad. It was too bad, but it was he, different clade, obviously. Yeah. So Eric is interesting because he's originally from, I think, Sweden, and then he decided to hang out in Cambodia. Yeah, he but, gave a really good talk. At that meeting, at the options twelve meeting, and so I said, I yeah. said to somebody, I want to meet him, and they said, Oh, I can, I can arrange that. So I, <laughs> I did get to meet him, so, and yeah. um, he, that school for uh, uh, 
that TWIV from the school, it looks like it's going to be about the third week of December is that that one will get released. Yeah, right. So, so the other the other part of that story is that uh, we stayed in Siem Reap, which was the uh, the town that uh, became famous because Cambodia beat off Thailand that was trying to annex a portion of Cambodia, and the town's name Siem Reap means we beat Cambo we beat uh, Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a clinic there, which was run by the Pasteur Institute for dengue fever. And you'll never guess where the people had to wait to see the doctor. Out in the front of the building, there was this big lawn. Probably by some water. And they, they <laughs> didn't have to be because these are tree hole breeding mosquitoes that carry it, right? So that they were surrounded by trees. And here they were sitting out in the open. A few people were there because they had dengue fever. A lot of people were there because they thought they had dengue fever. And there were even more people there that hopes that they didn't have dengue fever, they wanted to find out. Sounds like most of them will be getting it, dengue fever. It's a place to go catch huh. dengue well, fever. Well, that's interesting because we're going to talk about dengue today. Uh, exactly. So what, what I did was I, I gave them a textbook, our, our parasitic disease textbook, hmm. but I couldn't get inside the building to give it to them. And they thought it was some kind of a crank until I pulled out the book. And then I had to take my wallet out to show them who I was. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I I'm the write guy this. whose name is on the book. <laughs> <laughs> among others, among others. But please make sure this gets to somebody who can use it. And oh, oh, oh well, I'm glad to do that. Very interesting. And place. Um, if expanded circulation of wild polio one in Pakistan did not catch your fancy, I think we talked about that last week. And if circulating vaccine-derived polio 2 now in more than 53 countries was still not risque enough for your interest, there are three cases of circulating vaccine-derived polio 3 in French Guinea, South America. Maybe that will catch your eye. And that's at polioeradication.org this week. Polio continues to spread. Okay, on to our papers, our snippet today is in nature communications. Infectious parvovirus B19 circulates in the blood coated with active host protease inhibitors. And we have two co-first authors, Hyun Wook Lee and Ruben Asaraf, followed by Subramanian, Gutius, Bieri, Dinanno, Leisi, Bator, Hafenstein, and Rose. And these are from the University of Minnesota, the University of Bern, Penn State College of Medicine, and the Mayo Clinic. I don't think we ever talked about parvo virus B19 on TWIB. Does anyone remember? I it don't. might have been a long time ago because I think I remember us talking about fifth disease before. But Fifth disease. So this is a quite a, a widespread human pathogen. It causes a childhood rash called fifth disease disease. And whenever I talk about it, I try and remember the other four. I'm, I always screw up, but they're <laughs> measles. These are five childhood rash diseases, measles, rubella, chickenpox, roseola, which is herpes six and seven, and fifth disease caused by parvovirus B19. And in kids, uh, it's, it's a rash. They, they sometimes call it slapped cheek syndrome because the face looks really red. But uh, in adults, it can cause more serious diseases like uh, arthropathy, uh, aplastic crisis, and in pregnant women, it can cross the placenta and cause problems in the fetus like hydrops fetalis and miscarriage or fetal demise. So we check for the in the blood supply uh, because it, it's there. It's it's it, its pathogenesis has a viremia stage. Hey, hey, Dixon. How many genome types are there? <laughs> Seven. Excellent. <laughs> um, By the I, way, you, you left out uh -huh. an enormous group of organisms in rice fields. Uh, malaria is one of them. Yeah. He, and he schistosomiasis is, is one. Yeah, well, you said all kinds. He talked about them all in that. All, all and kind, that good. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Okay, yeah, fine. Uh, I didn't want to be left out. <laughs> the, the reason why I asked you about the yes. genome types is yes. because... Parvovirus B19 is um, a single-stranded DNA virus. Okay. Um, and so I don't know. We don't often talk about single-stranded DNA viruses. Mm, that's um, true. When we are talking about many of the viruses that we talk about here. And so I thought we should 
mention that, that does make it uh, this part of a virus a bit unique compared to many of the other viruses. We so, talk in about. fact, a few weeks ago, Kathy talked about AAV mm -hmm. as a vector. You know, AAV, adeno associated virus, is right. a helper dependent virus, but it's also got a single stranded genome and structurally looks like this. But this is a, an independent, helper independent virus. It can re rep replicate on its own. And remember However, what parvo means. Oh, I don't. Small. Parvo means small too? Yes, yes. Pico and parvo, okay. Yeah. Is parvo's not in Italian as a word for small somehow? <laughs> it's Latin. <laughs> well, well, you know, it seems Pico like it should Italian. be in Italian. That, yeah. that would make sense. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, how, the problem with parvo B19 is you can't grow it in cells in culture, right? It has a very specific tropism for erythroid progenitor cells of the bone marrow. Progenitor cells, not erythrocytes, right? Because viruses don't, erythrocytes don't have nuclei, right? So the toll-like receptors don't interfere with this virus uh, replication? Because it's a single-stranded DNA virus? Is, I mean, how does it escape that? Well, the TLR, yeah, it could be sensed. I'm sure it's sensed in some way. But... Um, I'll show you my student's thesis. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other reason I mentioned that it's a single strand DNA virus and that that's interesting is because that's actually the sensing of them is something that we are spending a lot of time so on. So, what's the sensor? Uh, probably sea gas, um, gas, but okay. uncertain. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I could go on for a long time about that, but I won't. So, um, when, when this virus uh, hits susceptible cells, these, these erythroid progenitor cells, Capsid undergoes a conformational change and some uh, domains of VP1. So the, the capsid is mostly made of VP2 with a few copies of VP1. And these VP1, when when the cell, when the virus hits a susceptible cell, uh, the, the, this part of VP1 comes out uh, and are essential for interaction with the receptor. Uh, so there's a little conformational change uh, that allows in receptor engagement. That's going to be important for this paper. Now. This you can't grow this in cells, so it's really hard to do structure. And so most of what has been done is using empty virus particles, virus-like particles, which you can make in non-replicative um, systems. But here they decided to purify the, the virus from from patient serum because there's so much in the in the in the blood that you can do this. And they find they get the structure, but also some other surprises, which is really cool here. Um, basically, they find two host proteins stuck on the virus particle as it's circulating in the blood that don't interfere with attachment of the virus to cells or infectivity, but apparently interfere with antibodies binding to the virus and blocking infection. So maybe so this is the, they call it a cloaking mechanism, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, yes. So uh, anyway, they purify B nineteen from. Uh, a donor, a donor, a plasma donor. They concentrate it and they purify it, and they can look at it under the EM, and they see it looks like you know roughly like a cathedral. But there seem to be some things sticking out off uh, the capsid. So they use cryo electron microscopy to get a 2.2 angstrom map, and they can see this is a parvovirus with an icosahedral shell, and the inside they they can see the DNA genome. And there's something sticking off the twofold axis of symmetry. Okay. And so they further refine the structure using a software package called Model Angelo. Isn't that great? <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> I'm glad they have a sense of humor. So they can now know all of the amino acids in their locations and, um, but that that's great, and I think that's very interesting. But what I want to focus on is that they they kept seeing this non-viral density on the micrographs and on their, um, their resolved structures, and it looks, they they say it looks like a protein, right? So they're really curious to know uh, what's what's there, and then as they were doing some computational processing to figure out what it was, they found a second protein. Uh, at the fivefold axis, so as as you may know, icosahedral particles are assembled with icosahedral symmetry, which means you take one or a few proteins and you repeat them many times. 
and you get five-fold axes of symmetry, which simply means there are five copies of the protein around the five-fold axis. There are two-fold and three-fold axes, right? So they find some extra density at the two-fold and five-fold uh, axis of symmetry. So this is a virus purified from patient blood. So think about how you would figure out what these proteins were, right? So basically they run gels, protein gels, and they do mass spec to identify the proteins. And uh, one protein is a protein called inter-alpha trypsin inhibitor heavy chain 4, ITIH4, all right? And this is a member of a family of protease inhibitors that are in the plasma. Um, so they say here they contribute to the extracellular matrix stability. And so they're inhibiting proteases. So these are protease inhibitors. And then the other protein they identify by mass spec is serpin A3. And again, a serpin is also a protease inhibitor. So both proteins are protease inhibitors, uh, and they're found broadly, as they say, in the four, all the kingdoms of life. Uh, and um, they, they, they confirm this by immunoprecipitation. Cool. They take antibodies to I, ITIH4 or serpin A3 or the virus, and all three antibodies can efficiently immunoprecipitate the virus particles. I don't know what, if people know what immunoprecipitate means. You want to you want to explain it uh, briefly, Brian? Sure. So the idea with immunoprecipitation is you are using an antibody to help you select a protein, or in this case, proteins that were bound to something out of a mixture of other proteins. And so you're going to use an antibody to bind to sort of your target that of interest, um, and then typically you will um, sort of have something that you that will attach to the um, FC portion of the antibody so that you can centrifuge and sort of pull that uh, protein of interest down, sort of like, you know, uh, you have a target and you put this antibody in as bait and then the bait binds to the target and then you centrifuge and get all of that target and that bait pulled to the bottom of your tube. And in the olden days, <laughs> you didn't even have to add something to bind to the FC receptor, although it makes it much easier and you don't have to spend as much time in the cold room. But I wonder if Dixon or Vincent ever did immunoprecipitations without Staph aureus protein A. Because oh, I no. did in my rotation project at the, at the SOC. <laughs> and I remember spending a long time in the cold room and pulling down these pretty much invisible pellets <laughs> but that right. was my right. that those were my immunoprecipitates so it was just at low temperatures they would immunoprecipitate yeah yeah, yeah. well we were um in the department of elvin cabot and he he was fond of saying that he even taught his secretary how to do a how to do a quantitative precipitation test <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you could also do uh, chromatography to separate that's right that's the big right. the big complexes that's from the right. unbound yeah which would also mean staying in a in a cold room, right? Mm -hmm. I remember back in the day. Back in the day, this guy in, on, the, on the floor at MIT, he would run columns and collect fractions, and he'd stand outside the cold room, looking in the little <laughs> glass window, counting drops, and he'd go in and he'd move the tube. But he'd he'd be out there smoking a cigarette because back in the days when you could smoke. <laughs> so he was a, he was a not so automatic fraction collector. <laughs> well, he probably someone was using it, and he just wanted to get ahead, so gotcha. he would count drops. Gotcha. There, and there then were... when, when he got close to the ten or whatever, he'd, he'd rush and put out a cigarette and rush inside. <laughs> well, the cooler, the 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 column that I had was very large uh, because I wanted to get a lot of antigen from my worm, and uh, it was inside of a cooling jacket that I could run a, sl a solution through so mm -hmm. I could have a cold room anywhere I wanted. So, you know. that, that is all very exciting. And I am feeling very thankful <laughs> for these proteins that are being made, that are made by certain bacteria as immune modulators that we now know bind to the yeah. FC portion of antibodies that's right, that's and that right. we take advantage of yeah. the lovely yeah. protein A and protein G. There, there, there were yeah. labs yeah. that bought um, down jackets on yeah. oh, their yeah. grants so oh, that God. they could right. you know, spend time in the cold rooms. Right. So then they say, okay, we have this parvovirus B19. It's binding two 
cellular protease inhibitors. Is this just this one patient that we had? Is it, or is it more common? So they get nine uh, other plasma donations that have B19 in them. And now they don't have to go and solve the whole structures again. They just do immunoprecipitation with antibodies against the virus or ITI H4 and Serpin uh, A3. And they can quantify the immunoprecipitate by PCR. And they said both proteins in every sample. So this is not an unusual thing. It's everywhere. They even find it. So one of the nine was genotype two, which they said is ancient and hardly circulates anymore. <laughs> and this also bound in addition to the other eight, which was genotype two, like the original one they did. So this has apparently um, been happening for a long time. So Vincent, with so much virus uh, and so much coating of the capsids, with the proteases, does the remo- protease inhibitors? Protease inhibitors is what I meant. Does the removal of the inhibitor allow trypsin that floats around in your blood all the time to start to become active when it shouldn't be? You mean does with it contribute respect to the virus? Yeah, does it contribute to the pathology of this infection? Yeah, they don't look at that. I mean, they do look at some other things. But they don't look at that. Because you'd have to have a trypsin cleavage site on the surface of the particle. People, people right? would ask, well, why would you need a, pr- a trypsin inhibitor circulating in your bloodstream when trypsin is produced in the pancreas? It's secreted into the gut tract and it helps you digest well, proteins. So that's a What's good question. Going on? So there are two aspects of this. Remember now, these pr- protease inhibitors are cloaking the whole virus. So yeah, there's, yeah, one, no, no, that's right. there's one thing they could be doing, but you're right. Are they doing something as a protease inhibitor, we don't know. Even at the end of this paper, we don't know the answer to that. Right. Yeah. But it could very well be. Well, and I think that Dixon's question also makes me think, you know, I, the cloaking is sort of the obvious um, thing that's going on here. And as an immunologist, I will, you know, would, would argue very much for that cloaking. But the idea of this sort of being something that soaks up the protease inhibitors so yeah. that proteases cannot be inhibited and perhaps prote- proteases are more active um, exactly is is I think something I hadn't thought of until Dixon just said it. Well, yeah, well and, and then my philosophical question is, you know, if the viruses are all doing this binding, they they even use the word um, the the virus employs two structurally distinct host proteins, which I wrote "ug" yeah. in the margin. I figure <laughs> yep. Vincent probably did too, um, because the virus is not employing anything. But right. it, anyway, but but it does beg the question why is this happening uh, because you know the, the cell is not going to make these things just so that the virus can bind them and be cloaked yeah but but how has the virus developed in such a way that it can fish out these two specific proteins to bind to it do these proteins play a role in binding of the virus to the cell no, they do not. We're going to they do that don't. experiment, right, coming okay, up. They don't. All right, they don't. So, but first they had the cool set of samples from patients that had given serial donations, and they turned out to be previremia, peak of viremia, and then antibody positive. First IgM and then <laughs> IgG. So th- the course of the infection, right? And they did immunoprecipitations at th- any of these stages. Previremia, well... Without virus, there's no virus to immunoprecipitate. But uh, the peak of viremia and well after, there's always these proteins bound to the virus particle. So as long as the virus is circulating in the blood, it's got these proteins. Okay, now they do the structures of um, these proteins uh, bound to the to the virus particle, and they want to know. So the, this the serpins inhibit. Remember, it's a protease inhibitors. They inhibit proteases. They, they call it a mousetrap-like mechanism. The protease will bind the protease inhibitor. It cleaves a, a recognition site in the protease inhibitor. And then the, the serpent undergoes a conformational change and traps the protease. So the protease activates it. Uh-oh, the mousetrap shuts on it. And so um, they want to know if the, on the virus particle, how did the serpent look? Was it the native state or the post Post cleave state, and it's native. There's no cleavage. You don't need any cleavage for it to attach to the virus particles. It's just the native state. 
And the same thing happens with the ITI uh, heavy chains. Um, they say this is at a pre cleavage state. So they're both enzymatically active as protease inhibitors. So there are people that are born with a genetic um, uh, rearrangement. They don't produce the uh, trypsin inhibitor. And they get a disease from that, obviously, because they, um, they can't control the trypsin that's circulating in their blood. Mm -hmm. So they have to give them, I don't know how they treat them. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that. But I was going to raise the idea that those people would be not susceptible or susceptible to this. But if you could have a mouse model that had a uh, humanized mouse model uh, that had trypsin and anti-trypsin factor, and then you take away the antitrypsin factor, and then you want to know whether or not the virus can carry out its infection. What role yeah. does this play in the infection? That's no, that's a good question. If you had a mouse model, that would be nice, and you could look at knockout. You could uh, serpent knockouts and so forth. But exactly. We don't, exactly. Don't have a mouse model, sadly. Don't have a mouse model. Th then they ask: Is are these serpent and ITIH4 are they active on when it's bound to the particle? Right? Can they inhibit proteases? So they mix them with, uh, with chymotrypsin, and yes, it can inhibit. So with the serpin, they do chymotrypsin and ITIH4. They use calicrine and other proteases, and the, um, the, the, the inhibitor is still active while it's bound to the virus, right? So native activity. So basically now these virions are protease inhibitors with these proteins bound to them. They go on to look at the, the exact interactions of the protease inhibitors with the capsid and see exactly where they're mapping. And they say, there are four known antigenic sites on the particle. And these cover all four of them. <laughs> okay, they, um, they, would, they didn't do an experiment where they... Um, looked at that. And in fact, you know, I'm just thinking now the immunoprecipitated with a capsid antibody and that worked. So, you know, computation, structurally, the protease inhibitors block the antibody, the four ep epitopes, but I don't know functionally what that means because they didn't do any experiments to look at that. All you know is that the bulky density covers the parts of all antibody footprints. Maybe it's not all, all of it and that's enough to get some antibodies bound. And then you might uh, ask now, do these protease inhibitors have any effect on infectivity? It, probably not because people are infected, right? And they have these protease inhibitors. But they wanted to see if protease inhibitor coded virions can enter and infect susceptible cells. So they, um, sure they, could. They, they grow, they propagate virus in cells and culture. And as you might guess, there's no serpin or IFIT. ITIH4 bound to them, right? Because that's a plasma protein. That's pretty cool. And um, th then you can add back serpin A3 and ITIH4 to those virus particles, and they will bind and assume their positions. It's really cool. And both preps, with or without these protease inhibitors, are equally infectious in these cells in culture. So the binding of these protease inhibitors doesn't interfere with entry an infection. And they further go on to look at that in some detail. As you know, there, as I mentioned before, this little piece of VP1 externalizes when the virus first bumps into a cell. And this still happens with the protease inhibitors bound. Uh, at, at, they do this at different temperatures. So at four degrees, you can bind virus and it won't get into cells. At 37, it will bind and get into cells. Uh, and they find that um, it, the the protease inhibitors start to come off as soon as the virus particles bind the cell. And when they come off, that allows this part of VP1 to come out and associate with the receptor and get endocytosed. So uh, these, these uh, protease inhibitors don't interfere with virus entry. It's pretty cool. No, but they do prevent antibody from interacting with the virus particle, though. Well, they never showed inhibition. that here. No, no, they, they never... They, I thought they did. No, they, they they did 
they look at the structure of the serpent and the other protein, and they, they say it covers a good part of the antibody they footprint. They speculate. All right, they're speculating. But so they say they must be a cloak. Maybe it's an immune evasion. But they never do experiments. I guess it's hard to do because you don't have uh, a cell culture model right, yeah. to do it in. Yeah. No, but um, you have a. You could make an antibody column. <laughs> Take the virus. Well, with you could the just do a lysis, right? And yes. then see if it yes. sticks or not. If it doesn't stick, then it's interfering with the antibody, right? So they say the overlap of protein binding and antibody footprints suggest that binding of host proteins hinders access to antigenic epitopes. Uh -huh. But they suggest. and they say this would explain why there's so much virus in the blood with these infections, and so you get infected. And, you know, you would think it would be cleared at some point, but it's not because they get cloaked. So it makes sense, but right, it, yeah, no. you need yeah. to figure it out. And, they, it, and these virus, this virus only infects pre-erythrocyte stage cells? Yeah, in the bone marrow. In yeah. the bone marrow. That's it. That's it. And I, I, back to my question of, you know, how is it that the cell is producing this, these proteins that then the virus can bind to and perhaps cloak itself? Um, again, anthropomorphizing in the way we shouldn't be doing, but um, is this part of an arms race or, or is it hard for it to be an arms race because the cell really needs these proteins as they are? Yeah, it, it's sort of hard yeah. to tell about that. They meant, they talk about the proteins as acute phase proteins um, at some point, and a lot of those are proteins that are going to be made dur early during a sort of inflammatory mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. And so they may be proteins that the sort of early infection is inducing um, more production of, but obviously they don't get into this here. Um, I, the thing that I really loved thinking about with this paper is, you know, I think about other mechanisms of cloaking, um, and we can think of lots of them, like I think of the glycan shield with HIV. Um, sort of blocking antibodies. And, you know, this is something that many viruses have evolved to do. And I hadn't really thought about it until looking at this paper, how many of our structures that we have seen of different viruses come from cell culture purified virus, as opposed to mm -hmm. the viruses like they're looking at here that actually came out of a yeah. patient. Yeah. Um, and that might partially be because of, you know, there aren't always enough virus. There's not always enough virus in the patient, and here they actually had to do that because they don't have the cell culture model. So it's it's, it's kind of some on each side of why that happened this way. But I want to know. So is this something that more viruses are doing, and we just don't see it because we yeah. usually are making the virus in cell culture, or is this really unique? Um, one might make an argument either way, but I think it's a it's a question I hadn't really thought about at all. Of how many of our structures might be a little off because they're coming from cell culture virus uh, sure. until I read this paper. So how do you catch this virus anyway? How is it transmitted? Yeah. Probably from the rash. Not from Let's a bone marrow up. transplant. <laughs> yeah. Let's look it up. Probably like a fomite situation. Well, with so much virus circulating, it could be droplet. Mm, true. Respiratory droplets. Bingo. And from a pregnant woman to her infant. And transplacental. Okay. So, so yeah, coughs, coughs and sneezes. So if you don't have that much virus circulating, then it would be difficult to transmit it, you think? Yeah. It, it looks like a Cleveland Clinic coughing, sneezing, and touching things someone with the virus touched. All the things we, wanted, <laughs> we expect. Indeed. Get your fingers off that virus. <laughs> so the, the last question is we mentioned... So we think these are cloaking and maybe helping to evade antibodies, but is the proteus activity providing anything else of advantage, right? Which we don't know because there are no experiments to do that here. So that's an interesting question. Lots of great questions and lots of more experiments for future people to do. And I like this this idea that they stumbled on this by it couldn't grow it in cell culture enough to do the structure, so... To get it from patients. So as, as Brian said, maybe there's things stuck on lots of viruses we don't know about because we use cell cultures. Right? So what's happening to the red blood cell count to these people? I believe they drop. 
Because what's the word for that? It, what's the it, word for that, Dixon? It's a hypo. <laughs> <laughs> what's the word for that? Anemia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you could anemia. say they wane <laughs> if you're a newborn. Yeah. We, your we blood, do cells blood cells are not being produced in the bone marrow; they're be- yeah. being produced in the liver, and it's a special hemoglobin. Hmm. It's Let's not see. normal hemoglobin. It's hemoglobin F, I believe, or fetus. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm seeing anemia. Yeah, Marvel 19 causes anemia in some people, yeah. Yeah, it would have to. <laughs> okay, so that's a cool paper. Interesting. Very. Um, with lots of implications. Okay, and you think so of we'll... other things that cloak, Brianne, at the high end of the spectrum of life. You've got the schistosomes, which they don't incorporate specific proteins. They incorporate the entire a retinue of proteins found in the serum, and they have uh, no specific receptors except for protein. And the mm. entire surface of the adult worms, which you can see with your naked eye, the immune system cannot see it because it's covered with us. And the only time you can see it is when they shed all of that and um, go on to another stage, and then you then you can see it. But once the uh, larval stage of this parasite goes to the lungs, it acquires the ability to cloak. And after that, it's it's totally invisible to the host. I really like your phrasing of this uh, parasite that's you can see with the naked eye, but the immune system can't see it. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's right. Not just hiding in plain sight. You know, if you can see them, <laughs> surely the macrophage can see them. And the answer is, walks right across it. It's just a bigger part of us. So there's another good example of a cloaking device in the bobtail squid. Yeah. So these squid take up bacteria yeah, that yeah, yeah, make yeah. light. And at night that's right, that's is when right. they're active. That's right. Uh, they can't be seen against the moonlight in the ocean, exactly. right? Because they're, exactly. they're, they're lighting up. And so the predators don't see them. If they were dark, they could be picked off. So they're cloaked. <laughs> well, it's also, they also, I think, the idea is that they don't um, obscure the sunlight from their prey. Also, right. so they could also get their prey pretty easily. Hey, I would I call that more like camo. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing is, at night, at the, in the daytime, they dig into the sand. The bacteria leave. They're gone. That's right. And then just before they come out at night, the bacteria recolonize. Yeah. So cool. It is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Biology is cool. There's a TED talk on that. Oh yes. Okay, we have another paper on dengue. This is PLOS pathogens. B cell receptor dependent enhancement of dengue virus infection. Chad Gibo, Hardy, McElvaney, Graham, Lou Moradpour, Carrier Friedberg, Gromowski, Thomas Chan, Deal, and Weichmann from uh, State University of New York and Syracuse, University of Vermont, and the Walter Reed Army Institute Research. And the only annoying thing about this paper is it's an uncorrected proof with big letters in front, which make it really hard to highlight. <laughs> Isn't it annoying? Yes. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I used to be able to edit this in or Acrobat and take out that. And now I can't do that anymore. No, you can't. They want me to buy another version of the program to do that. They want you to correct it and then send it to them. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, the dengue virus is spread by 80s families of mosquitoes there are four antigenic types one two three four and you know most most dengue infections resolve but some of them go on and you can get very sick you can get hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome that can happen after your first dengue it's it's pretty rare but uh, one of the uh, risk factors for it is having a second dengue of a different serotype which can give you uh, more severe disease and up till now, you know, antibody-dependent enhancement has been considered the, the reason to explain this. Uh, and that is, you know, you get infected with dengue type 1, you get better. And then sometime later, you get another serotype. You make a memory response to type 1. And those antibodies bind type 2, but they don't neutralize infectivity. And then they can, those antibodies can be taken up into cells that have FC receptors, primarily phagocytes. And right. this data argues against vaccination. 
<laughs> uh, no, not necessarily. Well, no, if um, you get if you get good response to all four serotypes, it should be fine. Oh, yeah. if you could do a multivalent. Yeah. So, yeah. well, and the the other thing is, um, as Vincent mentioned, the antibodies that are enhancing um, are not neutralizing. Uh, right. It seems to be a little bit of a lower affinity issue, and so. Right. When the antibody levels seem to be particularly high, and when there seems to be particularly high um, antibody levels, there is neutralization and the enhancement doesn't happen. Okay. Um, the way that I kind of talk about it with my students is that this is a situation where you sort of have mm. some meh antibodies, some mediocre antibodies, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> that are not able to neutralize, but they're still good enough to opsonize. That means that antibodies are going to be bound to the virus and now the virus is getting into the macrophage where normally the virus doesn't have macrophage tropism so normally macrophages can't be infected um but because of the antibody it, the virus sort of has a sneaky way into a macrophage and so we've increased the number of cells that are getting infected and changed the pathology so in this paper they said you know B cells have antibodies on them. Why couldn't yes, they do? They take up dengue virus and it replicates in B cells, right? So that's what they do experiments to test that here. Um in several different experiments. So first one, they take cells that are not susceptible to infection and they put um they engineer them to produce um an antibody which they also call a B cell receptor, right? Because when it's when it's in the B cell, it's a B cell receptor, right? Yeah. So the the you know one difference here is that um, with the the phagocyte, it's an antibody that was secreted, bound yeah, to right. this, and then later bound to a receptor on the phagocyte. Here, you didn't need any secretion. You didn't need any of that. The whole big part of a B cell is that it has a B cell receptor, which is just the antibody that it would have secreted, but yeah. not secreted stuck as a transmembrane protein. So they first took non-susceptible cells and they put uh, transmembrane antibody constructs. So there's an antibody which is stuck in the plasma membrane of the cell. And they have a, a dengue monoclonal and also a influenza hemagglutinin uh, monoclonal. And they find that um, the ones that have, the cells that have dengue will bind dengue virus, but if they have influenza antibody, they will not, as you would expect. And then they they infect them with a, a dengue virus, uh, encoding a fluorescent protein, so they can see uh, what's happening. Uh, and in fact, if you have the IgG on the surface of these cells, they get infected, which it, it's not just IgG. It will also work with IgM and IgA uh, as well. Um, but they did an interesting control. They put a cyto human cytomegalovirus IgG antibody on these cells, and it doesn't help that virus infect cells. So it doesn't work for all viruses. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, so you got to have the receptor that actually binds the virus yeah. to let the virus in. Yeah, they say that's because dengue doesn't really need a specific receptor. It just needs to attach to the cell, and then it can get in and, and do its thing. Uh, they they depend they compare the rate of this antibody dependent or BCR dependent infection to antibody dependent enhancement, right? Where they put uh, the, you have soluble antibodies, and then you have cells expressing FC receptors, and then you can use that to measure ADE. And they say they're comparable in terms of uh, virus uptake. Same rank order of ADE and BDE. So. This is these are cells uh, in culture again. All right, so then they say, okay, these are non non susceptible cells. Um, can we take cells that are, and they they kind of, all right. So they say, can we take cells that are already um, permissive to dengue, and can we make them more permissive? So they have human memory B cell lines uh, from human donors um, that are immortalized. Uh, and they um, they have antibody expression on their surface, and they have one clone that uh, binds uh, dengue virus, 
So the BCR is a dengue virus antibody, but they note that it doesn't neutralize it very well. And then they have a Zika antibody as a control. And so um, that antibody will not bind a dengue virus. So they take these cells. Again, these are uh, immortal human B cell lines, right? They expose them to virus, and then they uh, incubate and look at viral replication. And they do use flow cytometry because, again, they have a fluorescent reporter virus. And when you have a, the, the dengue antibody in the plasma membrane, you get more infection relative to Zika virus. And they can also find plus and minus sense dengue virus RNA in these cells, which suggests that uh, virus is replicating. I don't know why they didn't do plaque assay, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe it's too hard. I don't it's know. It's too but, old school. Uh, <laughs> and they also find a transcriptional signature consistent with lymphocyte activation and the, the production of cytokines. After this, in these cells that get that have the dengue antibody on the cell surface, so that's interesting because it's a B cell now. It's not. It's not some. Uh, other cell line in culture has no relevance to dengue infection. It's it's a B cell, which is may may be relevant, as you can see. Okay, now um, so these are transformed B cells. What about primary B cells? So we're making the right advances here. <laughs> so um, what they do is that they have dengue virus bound to um, an IgM that we know enhances infection. And then these are cross-linked to the, <laughs> the B cell receptor of B cells with an anti-IgM secondary antibody. I mean, Brian, how does that work? How does... So you got the dengue and IgM, and then the, the B cells are polyclonal, right? They've all got all kinds of antibodies on their surface. So how do they get the dengue antibody onto those cells by an um, anti-IgM secondary antibody? Because the B cells also have... Um, F FCs? FCs. Oh, okay. So that's just assessing whether B cells can support right, exactly. infection, basically. Anyway, so they do this first in Raji cells, which are transformed B cells, and it works. Um, Raji cells... you. Even at high MOI, it's hard to infect them. And then when you have all these components, dengue, the IgG, the, I, the IgM, then you get um, good infection of Raj G cells. Yeah. So, so the key part, there's, a, there's sort of a key piece of immunology that you have to think about at, you know, at this point of the paper. And I will also say the, the next part, um, I looked at the sort of subheading in the results mm. and i sort of had to i spent a time i was like yeah that's really obvious why are you like i there was a, there was a certain moment where i was like like why do i care but it's actually an important point that people should think about with this um in the antibody dependent enhancement setting with the macrophage mm. it's obviously because it's a macrophage macrophages aren't specific to the virus yeah um, and so no matter how many times you've had um, dengue virus, you have the same number of macrophages in your body. Mm -hmm. The thing that might change as you get infected a second time is you might change the amount of antibody that's present. Right. And that might make it more likely for the virus to get stuck to um, the macrophage. What's unique about the mechanism they're showing here is that the B cell is using its B cell receptor it to bind to the virus. Mm -hmm. And that means that the B cells that are getting infected are the B cells who would have made antibodies to fight dengue. Right. Because the, the B cell receptor is the... Um, antibody specificity that the B cell makes. Right. So it's not as though all B cells are potentially getting infected here. It's the specific B cell that fights dengue virus that's yeah. getting infected and is becoming a target. 
So they're going to be in everybody, some B cells with an antibody that recognizes dengue, right? Right. and But those B cells are going to be rare in, right. in everybody. And then after infection, their numbers are going to go up, right? Exactly. And so that was the thing that I sort of, the, the connection where I was like, oh, wait, once you have an infection with this, you are going to have these cells proliferate. You are yeah. going to actually make more of the target cells because you need to, to make the antibody response. But it turns out those same cells that you just made more of are now targets as yeah, well. Right. So if you want a definition of self-fulfilling prophecy, <laughs> <laughs> this one's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So they, they actually have a, a challenge experiment that they do. They have volunteers that they infect with a um, attenuated dengue 3 vaccine. And they can get PBMCs from those people, you know, Day zero, 28, and 90. So just before infection and then 28 and 90 days later. So they have eight people. Um, and then they can see by flow cytometry what fraction are, are able to be infected with dengue virus. So they see an increase in the number of inf in dengue infectable B cells on day 28 and 90 relative to uh, pre infection. And they also looked at T cells and monocytes, and don't see any increase there. So it's consistent with what Brianne has, has said that as you're making more B cells uh, specific for dengue virus, then you get more cells to infect. Right. And we should probably also mention, because this mentions a, a dengue vaccine, and Dixon also mentioned the dengue vaccine before, um, there have been a few. Um, dengue vaccine modalities that mm -hmm. have been um, researched, um, one of which that people think about a lot is inducing an antibody and B cell response primarily. Um, that's one called Dengvaxia that I know that people have talked about at length. Um, and there is sort of this alternative um, dengue vaccine that may induce a T cell response um, and largely work through a major T cell response. And this might be some additional reason why T cells may be very important for dealing with this virus because we it doesn't have this enhancement ability. Um, and based on how T cell receptors work, you wouldn't really expect any kind of enhancement ability mm. the same way you would with B cells. And yeah. so I think that this is also further evidence that a T cell vaccine may be a way to go with dengue. So for dengvaxia, the problem there is that it had a suboptimal type 2 response. And so you, the kids would get it. They'd make hardly any type 2 antibodies. They'd be the meh antibodies. And then <laughs> they get type 2 and they get severe disease. So, um, yeah. That, but then that, there's a subsequent vaccine that makes a better response to all of them. So I'm, I'm thinking, what else could you do? Because this is another component of uh, enhanced disease, right? I'm, I'm sure ADE is still there, mm -hmm. and this maybe plays some role, but how much, right? How would you know? Yeah, I think that would be really it. Because you get people that don't make antibodies. No, you, you need you, the antibodies. Well, anyway. yeah. So what you'd want to do is you'd actually want to look at people with hyper IgM syndrome, mm -hmm. who only who can't class switch their antibodies uh -huh. and so who can only make IgM antibodies um, and can't make IgG. Um, and the reason why I would think about those patients is that those patients still have B cells. They just don't have the antibody that's being secreted to enhance. And so in that case, they wouldn't have um, the antibody dependent enhancement, but they could still have B cell en dependent enhancement. Um, because they have B cells, they just don't have the secreted antibody. And so you could look and see, is there a difference in um, people who have the ability to do both antibody-dependent enhancement and B cell enhancement? Right. Or uh, yep. is different pathogenesis when you can only do one? So giving a patient that's got dengue for the second time, immunoglobulin therapy is like throwing gasoline on the fire. Well, if the, if the antibodies are high affinity and they neutralize effectively, it shouldn't be a problem, right? That's the problem in here that okay, okay, you get okay. low titers and that's okay. when you get this. Um, you could make a monoclonal yeah. that way. 
obviously. They could. So yeah. why don't they? It's expensive and it doesn't last very long. It saves lives. It does, but how often would you have to give it in a dengue endemic area? What is the death rate from dengue fever? <laughs> During outbreaks, it's huge. Sure. And not only that, you're setting up a whole bunch of new people to die the next time it comes around. Yeah, that's a good question. Why don't we use <laughs> monoclonals for dengue? High affinity monoclonal. Is it therapeutic monoclonal on the way? This there is, is a one. 2024 Lancet article. Don't hold your breath. It's the, the, the thing is, is it on the way? Right. Oh, is? Oh, I say it's a question rather than an answer. All right. It is unlikely that... Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, they're saying we should have an antibody, but there isn't. Yeah, we should. <laughs> hmm. Huh. Oh, from Ung Ong Ui from Singapore, whose paper we did a couple of months ago. Cool. All right. So um, that's that. Very cool. We have we have time for some letters now. Excellent. Okay, Dixon, take the first one. <clears throat> Happy to do it. Uh, Mauritius writes. Marius. Dear, Marius. Okay, dear, Mar dear Marius. Uh, <laughs> picky, picky, picky. It's not so picky. There's no more. No, no, it's I'm even close to Mauritius. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I, I misread it. I, dear okay. Vincent and the TWIV team, I wanted to thank you for covering our nature communications paper. I had a great time listening to your discussion, and many of the co-authors were very excited as well. A few thoughts about MOI, because it, it, because there is some interesting biology there. We used to think about MOI in a simple way, where if you infect 1,000 cells with 1,000 PFU, MOI equals one, then around 630 cells are going to be infected with one or more variants. And these 630 cells are all going to start a reproductive infection with roughly the same timing. With S HSV1, and this is what happens when you do the infection in vero cells or other very susceptible cell lines. Once the virion infects a cell, it's going to start producing more viruses after a few hours. We think that things are different in neurons, both in mouse neuronal cells we used or in vivo, and that all infected neurons do not immediately start a productive infection after viral entry, and some probably never do. In that scenario, some neurons start reproductive infection immediately after entry, while some are delayed by many hours or days. In this asynchronous infection, viruses coming from cells that are immediately productive are going to super infect cells with a delayed infection, leading to high levels of co-infection and gene drive recombination. This is why the experiment works so well, even with MOI equals one, the effective co-infection rate ends up being very high after a couple of days. A note about but the Buck Institute. It is indeed a very beautiful place in Marin County and a great place to study biology of aging. Eric Verdon, who I did my postdoc with, had spent most of his career as an HIV virologist before focusing more on the immunology of aging recently. I was one of the last remaining virologists in his labs. I used to listen to TWIV every week during my commute up and down the 101. I also really enjoy the little brainstorming session about how to design a gene drive to suppress disease. You'll have to stay tuned. Warm regards, Marius. P.S. I'm glad you remembered and are using my little trick to keep slides pretty. <laughs> That's Mauritius, Dixon. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> it might be Marius. Marius, yeah. Mary. Cool name. I like it. <sighs> Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Yes. Stephen writes, you guys did a great job discussing our recent cell paper. I thought I could clarify one point of the confusion about why raccoon dogs were in the market. So raccoon dogs are not farmed for the purpose of human consumption, but they do end up as food animals in markets in central and southern China. The first attached paper describes this well. It's from the Chinese guys who happened to be sampling Wuhan markets in 2019 before the pandemic. While approximately 30% of mammals were clearly wild-caught, indicated by trapping and shooting wounds, 
The captive breeding of other species is commonplace in China. Raccoon dog fur farming is legal in China. However, due to a drop in fur prices, raccoon dogs are now frequently sold off in live animal markets, augmented by wild-caught individuals. You may also enjoy this second quite wild paper about raccoon dogs in Vietnam. They had been thought to be extinct in the wild, but were then found to be getting trapped in a remote area of limestone caves, the habitat for horseshoe bats, then being sold on Facebook Marketplace for consumption. Hmm. So, and this is uh, Stephen Goldstein from the LD Lab, whose paper was done. Yeah. So you also, also know that raccoon dogs are major sources of outbreaks of trichinellosis uh, throughout the areas where raccoon dogs are found. Oh, didn't and, know that. Yeah, big deal. I we had to look up uh, in our annual meeting. We used to have an annual meeting for trichinella, and it went to a two or three year meeting. Uh, they Nobody knew what a raccoon dog was, so we <laughs> we had to look one up, and they they're very strange looking animals, actually. I I have mentioned them in a couple of my classes, and what I have learned is that as soon as I mention them, my students immediately start googling. <laughs> yeah. Um and yeah. half of them um, think they are very compelling and want them as pets, um, and the other half, you know, are are not a fan. Want to make a fur coat out of them. They, they also <laughs> actually um, argue about whether they look more like raccoons or dogs. Exactly. <laughs> but they are definitely carnivores. Interesting. Yeah. So the, this thing in Vietnam, uh, mm. they don't know because you don't know if there was any SARS-CoV-2 there. But it's interesting that people are, that they, they're, in, they're in where the bats live. That are the, the hosts of coronaviruses, right? And they were selling them on Facebook Marketplace. Yep. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Hmm. Um, Brian, can you take the next one? Sure. Jeffrey writes, I think it was Dr. Palmier who suggested in this episode, in relation to a blueberry virus, oh, that one dear. possible way to deal with it might be to use Saskatoon berries instead, suggesting they were closely related to blueberries. Surprisingly, to even people here in Saskatoon, Saskatoon berries are not closely related to blueberries. Wikipedia shows that Saskatoon berries are rosids, whereas blueberries are ericales. These are very different branches of flowering plant. They are about as closely related as kiwi fruit is to maple trees, despite looking and tasting similar. Saskatoon berries are delicious, apparently relatively healthy to eat, and resilient to cold. It gets cold here in the winter. I do not know whether anyone has even looked into Saskatoon Berry's specific viruses, but I will make a point to ask Angie Rasmussen, who is a local here at VIDO. Maybe she'll know someone who has looked into this. Jeff. I'm sure they have viruses, right? They must. They Everything do. has viruses, right? Yeah. Yep. I do know this, that Saskatoon Berries are a favored food item for grizzly bears in the fall. And uh, one year... When I was out fishing in uh, Alberta, there was a, a killing frost in June, which uh, killed all the flowers. So there were no Saskatoon berries in the fall. Hmm. So instead of eating Saskatoon berries, they ate the Saskatoon berry pickers, namely people. And unfortunately, four fishermen lost their lives uh, to bears that had no alternative but to turn to uh two-legged Saskatoon berries instead of the normal bush. And I remember when they were when they were in bloom and they were produced prodigious amounts, I could take my hat, which I used obviously to keep out the sun rays, right? And you keep it at the end of this branch and you run your hand down the branch into your hat. And by the time you get almost halfway down the, the branch, your hat is filled with the berries. Hmm. And you just sit there and you gorge yourself and look at the beautiful scenery and 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 know you actually know that even if there were bears in the area they wouldn't pay any attention to you whatsoever cuz they like them also so saskatoon berries are also known as service berries yeah and mm -hmm. they have a bunch of other names um saskatoon berry pacific service berry western service berry western shadbush or western juneberry yeah. and so when you said that um they are produced in the fall, Vincent. I was surprised because here in Ann Arbor, 
the they bloom in late April, early May. In fact, I've noticed the time that they bloom changing as things have gotten warmer over the last 20 some years. But um, so they bloom and it's about a month later that the berries are produced. Right. I, I didn't uh, have a qualm with that. It, it said that in the fall that year when they failed right. in the summer, Got it. the bears okay. were now at the... Got it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And they, um, they're, they're really nice uh, shrubs yeah. or trees. Um, I had one grow so tall that I had to have it taken yeah. out and get another yeah. one put back in. Uh, but they have right. these beautiful blossoms. And then in the fall, they have, like blueberries, they have the really colorful fall foliage. So... And the one little bit of difference about the fruit is that they have a, a bit of a pronounced seed, but yeah. um, you, it doesn't get caught in your teeth like raspberries and blackberry seeds, no. um, um, but it just adds a little bit of texture. Um, and it's not uh, uh, yeah. distasteful or anything like that, no. but they're really good. They, no, they make pies, muffins. Unbelievable, unbelievable yeah. good. John writes, Doctors Twiv. <laughs> Pamela Bjorkman's work seems to be a more technically sophisticated version of an approach that I think I recall from one of Vincent's virology lectures of a follow-up vaccine containing the same less immunogenic but more conserved epitope from an original virus together with a new epitope from a new variant to coax the immune system into mounting a response to conserved regions. But maybe what he was describing in his lecture was her approach from the beginning. So this this is the uh, mosaic nanoparticle experimental SARS-CoV-2 vaccine we talked about a couple of weeks ago where she combines um, <clears throat> receptor binding domains from different spikes of different Sarbeco viruses into a nanoparticle. And that gives you a broad uh, antibody response. I, I don't remember talking about it in, <laughs> in lecture, John. I don't think I ever mentioned it in any of my lectures. Maybe, so maybe, maybe like a flu. Um, yeah, it could have been the flu, the head and the stalk idea, right? Where you try and get uh, responses to stalk domains by putting irrelevant heads on. That could have been it. Anyway, back to John. Otherwise, you touched on two pairwise items: import restrictions and Nobel laureates. Hugo Theorel, medicine or physiology, fifty-five, in whose lab. Both my PhD and postdoctoral mentor worked, told the story of crossing U.S. customs in the early 50s to collaborate with Britain Chance at UPenn. Customs inspector holding up a vial. And what is this? HT, that's Hugo, alcohol dehydrogenase. CI, and what is that? HT, well, it's an enzyme. CI taking a different approach. Where does it come from? <laughs> HD. Well, we purify it from the livers of horses. CI. So it's a meat extract. HT. Well, yeah, I guess you could say that it's a meat extract. <laughs> CI triumphant. Proceed. No duty on meat extracts. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. The customs inspector did not want to do the hassle of paperwork of not allowing yeah. that yeah. through. <laughs> also, Alan mentioned his skink, and then roadkill came up later, plus I mentioned the governor of Florida. You may be familiar with Carl Hyacin's novels, all set in Florida. <laughs> in about half of them, the avenging angel is a one-eyed guy named Skink, who was once the Florida governor who, fed up with rampant corruption, left the governor's mansion one night, never to return. Now living deep in Florida swamps, he subsists on roadkill. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that. Meteorology. A few days of highs in the low 50s, but we are back to high 60s, low 70s by the weekend. And a stretch of six clear days starts tomorrow. So we may be able to see the actual meteor here in Greater Braddock. Okay. Back to the top. Dixon. Steve writes, Dear Vincent and Twivers, Short note. I have listened to the Twivcast speak about the need for basic research funding in virology paper that you reviewed in episode 1157 on mosaic sarbicovirus nanoparticles, experimental vaccines, seems to support your claim strongly. While listening to your review of the paper, it occurred to me how important knowledge of sarbicoviruses in bats and pangolins could contribute to a better COVID-19 vaccine, and that a mosaic vaccine 
might prevent future pandemics. Where would the study have been without the sequence data from sabricoviruses of eight plus bat species and pangolins? I was a little surprised that the TWIV team didn't highlight this. Of course, I could have missed that part of the discussion because I was daydreaming about the possibilities of improved vaccines. Oh, by the way, I'm a retired plant biologist from upstate New York. I started listening to TWIV in 2020 and look forward to the classical paper reviews and updates by Dr. Griffin each week. Excellent service to your specialization in the, and the general public. Your work has important secondary effects too. As a result of listening to TWIV, I sat in an immunology class in 2022, having read a couple of books on viruses and immunology, and then signed up to serve as a vaccine ambassador for our country's health department, they, our county health department. Thank you for my education. Kudos to the TWIP crew for spreading the word of evidence-based information. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, are you next? Yes. Frank writes, Hi, Dr. Racaniello. I hope this email finds you well. I'm an avid listener of the This Week in Virology podcast and deeply appreciate the insightful discussions you and the team provide on a wide range of topics in virology. Recently, I came across an intriguing article by Dr. T.J. John and jo colleagues published in Infectious Disease that proposes an alternative view on the transmission of poliovirus. The authors assert that poliovirus can be transmitted via respiratory droplets, i.e. the respiratory route, rather than solely through the fecal-oral route as traditionally accepted. The full citation for the article is, and he lists that, lists that here in Infectious Diseases 2024. Moreover, the authors use this assertion to argue for an absolute shift from the use of live attenuated oral polio vaccine to the inactivated polio vaccine. Given your expertise on poliovirus, I was curious to know your thoughts on these assertions, particularly regarding the proposed respiratory transmission route and its implications for vaccine strategy. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this matter. Keep up the excellent work on TWIB. Okay, and then there were notes in here that were in purple, but I think they might have been from Vincent. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, do you want me to summarize them? Uh, well, however you want to do it. <laughs> you can read them, actually. That's fine. Okay. Examining respiratory transmission of poliovirus has been ongoing since the 1930s. Mechanism of transmission of the virus may be influenced and occur by the environment in which the virus finds itself. It is not an all-or-none phenomenon. Furthermore, respiratory transmission may not occur in the absence of oral-fecal transmission. The opposite, oral fecal transmission of the virus can and often does occur in the absence of respiratory transmission. Oral polio, oral polio vaccine challenge studies suggest occasional oropharyngeal excretion among susceptibles or seronegative individuals and rare among seropositive in patients or those who were given the inactivated polio vaccine or had viral infection. And uh, Vincent lists a number of references. Okay. Irrelevant to the mechanism of poliovirus transmission, IPV, the inactivated, should have been the vaccine of choice for eradication for several reasons. The first is the genetic instability of the Savin vaccines of poliovirus. Those are the, the vaccines in the oral, the strains in the oral vaccine. Despite the folklore, Sabin absolutely knew that his vaccine strains were unstable and same-day massive vaccination vaccine campaigns are when OPV should be used, and only then, because this accounts for genetic instability of the virus. Sabin and the Soviets. Is that a, a book or an article, Vincent? Yeah, it's an article. Okay. It is the continued misuse of OPV that leads to outbreaks of VAPP, which stands... Vaccine-associated paralytic polio. Thank you. The second, uh, second, one only needs to prevent the neuroinvasion of the virus. The immune response elicited after IPV administration does this extremely efficiently. Third, but not la the last, and again, despite the folklore, paralytic poliomyelitis was greatly controlled, more than a 95% reduction of cases here and in Europe by the administration of the IPV, not OPV. As a side note, Scandinavia never switched from IPV to OPV, and there have been no reports of virus circulation or cases of paralytic poliomyelitis since the 1990s. Yeah. 
I can take that out. <laughs> ah, okay. Administration of trivalent oral polio vaccine, all Sorry. three serotypes, um, to more than 90% of the Finnish population in 1984 to control a type 3 wild polio virus epidemic, gave an opportunity to study the persistence of OPV viruses under the conditions of intense and sensitive environmental surveillance. Countrywide sewage sampling detected OPV viruses for up to six months after the vaccination campaign. OPV does not stamp, stop transmission. So, yeah, I, I think that says it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Brianne. Uh, Thomas writes, hello, I wanted to ask about your thoughts on how climate change in affects the spread of infectious disease, specifically viruses. Also, thank you all again for the work you do. Uh, many thanks, Thomas. Um, and there's a note here from someone about uh, 12896, um, which discussed a paper that is both fascinating and a little bit terrifying. Um, the TWIV uh, title was Climate Change and Zoonosis Risk. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, ways that climate change is infecting spread of infectious disease, whether that may be related to changes in where hmm. um, hosts of different viruses live, um, overlap of different species that may allow for different kinds of transmission, uh, stress on different organisms that may change their level of viral shedding, um, lots and lots and lots of uh, things. People have um, done quite a bit of modeling um, on this, that, again, that I mentioned um, is in a paper that's both fascinating and terrifying. And of course, um, this is especially uh, important for many of our vector-borne uh, infectious diseases. And so um, it does seem as though climate change will very much exacerbate um, many infectious diseases. For sure. Nial writes, Florida madness and the power of radio. Hi, all. Hearing Vincent's comment about if only people listen to virologists like they did, Meteorologist, I couldn't help but comment. Yeah, this is the Florida governor says he, he based his telling people to evacuate based on meteorological reports, right? As someone who has been deep into the often futile attempts to counter conspiracy thinking with facts on Twitter spaces for a while now, I can assure you this is not the case. If anything, it appears to be getting worse. There is a growing belief that the Democrats have a storm creation machine and that Hurricane Milton is an attempt to make it difficult to get to the polls. Others just don't believe the data at all. As is often the case, there is a Simpsons quote for that, and he gives a, a quote on X. Regarding radio, here's a story about a civilian's attempt to use it on a large scale to protect Ukraine from drones. And he gives a link to an article in Technology Review. Meet the obsessed civilian, and I can't read the rest because I got crap coming up. Oh, yeah, read the obsessed radio obsessed civilian shaping Ukraine's drone defense. Very interesting. Keep up the good work. Thank Jolene for the timestamps, as I cannot always listen as thoroughly as I used to. Back to you, Dixon. Uh, Nikki writes regarding the claim in episode 1155 that anti mask harassment has gone away. You may want to ask some women who regularly mask about this. Even here in liberal San Francisco Bay Area, I regularly get harassed about my mask by random men in public. I can't see your smile. I want to reply with, I'm not wearing a smile anymore. But that's not often safe. Considering the lack of understanding and acceptance, even in friendly social situations, like parties, when I explain that I'm immune compromised, there's little point in explaining myself to strangers. Nonetheless, if it seems safe, I still do, in hopes of educating folks to think first uh, next time, but it's tiring. Might as well be shoveling the ocean, because this behavior is based in sexism as much as anti-mask attitude. attitudes. Hard to imagine anyone, uh, someone complaining that they can't see a guy's smile. <laughs> Listening since episode one. Keep up the invaluable public education. Wow, that's Nikki. pretty good. P.S. Episode one. I know. <laughs> locally, our highest masking density seems to be at Trader Joe's market, especially, um, except when hospitals periodically enforce masking. Yeah, I, I 
I wear a mask in crowded places, and I always wonder if someone's going to say something, but nobody has. They know I don't smile. <laughs> You're grumpy. Grumpy. That's right. Uh, Kathy. Greg writes, regarding politics and science as discussed in the good-humored letter from Chris in TWIV 1155, I have to disagree that, quote, there is no distinction between the two, science and politics, end quote. In my view, science is about acquiring knowledge, while politics is, is about debating and deciding on governmental policy and actions. Yes, professional scientists engage in politics and may even acquire some knowledge in the process, but that is not the same as conducting experiments, engaging in peer review, and other activities commonly understood as science in recent decades. Practically all humans and sentient animals acquire knowledge from their lived experience, but there is generally a lack of controls or careful collection and analysis of data. If all methods of acquiring knowledge are considered science, as was suggested in the discussion of this letter, this overlooks and undermines the importance of great advancements that occurred in the last two centuries in what we now call science. Some ideas are supported by extensive data. Should these be given the same value as politically popular falsehoods? I think not. If you are still unconvinced about fundamental distinctions between science and politics, try a thought experiment. <laughs> Compare and contrast methods in science and methods in politics. Then let's vote on it or having or have a shouting contest about it. Best regards, <laughs> Greg. Greg has one of the better lines I've ever heard. Yeah. Practically all humans and sentient animals acquire knowledge from their lived experience. Does that mean that some humans don't? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. You shouldn't say everyone because you can always be wrong, right? Uh, it's true. Yeah. So I, I had a problem with Chris's original letter, I, but I didn't know how to disagree. So I, I think this is a good rebuttal. I like this. Okay. we're Oh, we have one more. Cool. Brianne. Jonathan writes, hello, wanted to correct your podcast. Horses are a dead end host. So vaccinating them does not lower the risk to people as they do not have a high enough viral load to transmit. Only birds are the amplification host. Also, core vaccines are what the American Association of Equine Practic Practitioners recommends every horse in the U.S. be vaccinated. Hmm. Um, so I do not remember. Ex I, this makes me think about West Nile, but I'm not positive yeah. that West Nile is the uh, virus to which he is referring. Yeah, I think that's what yeah, my. I think it was West Nile. I think and so. I think Alan said if, if you vaccinate horses, you. Reduced transmission, and I thought, uh, but I didn't want to correct them at the time. <laughs> We're going to get letters, <laughs> but yeah, he this he is absolutely right. Horses don't transmit; neither do people. To no, each other. It, the only people that could possibly transmit West Nile are children. Yeah, they get very high viral titers compared to adults. Yes, I remember you suggested that is the way the virus came to the U.S. That's correct. That is right. Which I suppose is possible, well, but we'll never know. Well, had to know. get here somehow. And it did start at the Bronx Zoo. So, And there was a huge gorilla exhibit at the time mm -hmm. with 3 million visitors. And, uh, yeah, it, it looked pretty suspicious. How many That's gorillas were there? Um, there was an entire family. There was like 23 lowland gorillas. Wow. They were they all on vacation. They had tickets to the latest shows. They got... <laughs> Good seats at restaurants, you know, that sort of thing. Fresh bananas. <laughs> okay. We have gone through our letters. That's really cool. We do. Yeah. So now let's do some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? So I have a Scientific American <laughs> article that um, I saw shared on social media um, that is called The Staggering Success of Vaccines. Um, it's also uh, listed as see how many lives vaccines have saved, which of course has been, uh, and this article that came out about three weeks ago or so in Scientific American um, has been shared quite a bit in the past couple of days as people are, you know, think, wanting to think about evidence in favor of vaccines. Um, I really like this article. It's largely based on a Lancet study. Um, so I also have a link to the Lancet study here, um, looking at some mathematical modeling um, regarding um, success of vaccines. The Scientific American article that I mentioned does a really nice job of also talking about how vaccines are linked to 
um, equity in terms of health um, and ways that thinking about vaccination programs are linked to other aspects of public health. And so I really like the article um, in terms of thinking about public health, uh, though I first was excited about reading it because of the, all of the data and numbers um, that it presents. And so I kind of like it in a couple of different reasons. Um, but one of the things, for example, um, that this talks about is that um, it, this shows that um, the model suggests that measles vaccine has saved 94 million lives over the past 50 mm. years wow. and that the 14 common vaccines that they study in this um, have uh, the vaccines against those have saved 154 million lives, um, which comes out to six lives per minute. Um, they note that um, each life saved through vaccination results in an average of 66 years of health. Um, in an individual, um, infant mortality cut by 40%. There was one that it, I'm trying to think. It said a 25-year-old now has a 35% greater chance of living to their next birthday, Thinking, looking at vaccines alone. Um, and they do some modeling of other public health interventions versus vaccines. They talk about how for every dollar you invest in vaccines, you get $54 benefit. Um, and so I just thought there was a lot of really great information about vaccines. The, Im the uh, images here, the, the figures are fascinating um, in looking at the data on impact of vaccines. And so if at any point, um, anytime coming up, you really want to be arguing in favor of vaccines, this article mm -hmm. has a lot of the data that you might want in one place um, and has very dramatic uh, graphs. Okay, and that's I, just I, about. Go ahead. I, I'd seen. I had seen this also. I, I almost picked it, Brianne. It's really good. It's mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. This is only about mortality rates. Mm -hmm. Now imagine how much uh, dailies were saved by people not being hospitalized. Yeah the the Lancet article gets into that a little bit more, um, mm -hmm. but most of it's just about the the number of lives that are saved, and the numbers are dramatic. Sure. Sure, but I think the other one would be even more dramatic if you could oh, talk course. about billions of people, right? Carl Sagan numbers of people rather than, <laughs> you know, my uh, present bank account numbers. <laughs> just no, just wait, kidding, just kidding. Just wait here in the U.S. what's going to happen. You'll see. So I was a little surprised as I'm just looking through this for the first time that um, the COVID-19 vaccines aren't in these big graphs that I'm looking at. The yeah, millions they, and millions saved. they talk a little bit about um, the COVID-19 vaccine at the very end of the article. OK, um, but the Lancet was specifically looking at the UN or the WHO's expanded program on immunization and the, uh, the effects of the vaccines in that um, in that program over the past 50 years. Um, and so it's focusing on those 14 vaccines. Right. Dixon, what do you have for us? I uh, got more pictures to share with you guys and gals. Um, this time it's digital nature pics, winners for the 2024 Wildlife Photographer of the Year. And the first picture is absolutely stunning. It shows a jaguar taking down a caiman in the south, in the Pantanal. And um, to have the temerity. <laughs> the courage and the hunger level <laughs> necessary for this event to actually occur. How do, how do you teach that to your kids? I mean, um, there must be times when it doesn't work and <laughs> the other one wins. <laughs> and then to say, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to do that now. Nah, you know what? I'm, vegetarianism, that's what I'm headed for. Uh, they actually had a video of this, uh, a, a similar event of a jaguar stalking a caiman along the bank. And the caiman was totally unaware of the fact that the jaguar was there. And you should see the stealth used by this jaguar. It didn't have to go through these coatings that viruses, <laughs> and, you know, they just, they just hung low. And then the last minute, and it was about a six or eight foot bank that this uh, jaguar had to, to overcome to get down to the water level and it jumped into the water and there was a big splash and all kinds of, and the next thing you know, up the bank, this thing had it in his jaws 
not even in pause. I mean, it was, he was lifting basically its own weight out of the water to get it up on land so it could finish the kill. So they must do this on a regular basis. And um, at any rate, it's a great photograph. It's mm -hmm. a, just yeah. a wonderful These, these are all in great time. photos. Yeah, wonderful. Moment in time. I, I had scrolled down and found the two tawny owlets in a tree. All right. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Those uh, are cute. I, I like the dancing stoat. Mm -hmm. Some yes. adorable <laughs> some adorable shots. Yes. You got to be there at the moment. That That's the whole idea about this kind of photography. Yeah. If you're not willing to spend the time, you'll never get one of them. Yeah. Never, never do it. Uh, at any rate, these are heartwarming and uh, relieving to know that they're still natural processes going on somewhere that we can uh, enjoy watching. Kathy, what do you have for us? So it's a trifecta here. The first one is the sort of lay level article, 450 million year old arthropods preserved in fool's gold. And then I have the primary article. And then I have a little uh, video about pyrite, which is fool's gold. And basically these kinds of fossils have been found before, but this one finds this very fine structured, very small uh, uh, Lomancus edgecombii, uh, and it's delicate tissues. And the way they have it depicted, uh, they have, you see the top and the bottom, but it, it's two side by side and it almost looks like a pair of earrings. Um, they're sparkly gold. And basically um, these form when there's not very much oxygen around and there's a lot of, uh, uh, organic material. And so that leads to the formation of pyrite, which is iron disulfide, FES2. And um, so I just thought it was really pretty. And I wanted to go back to, you know, what exactly is fool's gold chemically? Mm -hmm. And then I found this little, uh, short little video that tells you about pyrite. And so that's my pick. Do you, do you subscribe to Discover? No, I don't. This came in a science feed. Yeah. Um, I get science feeds now from Science and AAAS and ASM, and and I'm yeah. not sure. It, it doesn't make okay. sense that it would have been ASM, but it was one of the other two. Yeah, I just wonder how people get information because you can't read everything, right? No, right. you can't. <laughs> okay. Oh, that brings us to me. Okay, so I have an article uh, in Nature by Jeff Tollefson from November 6th. We need to be ready for a new world. Scientists globally react to Trump election win. It's just the reactions of various scientists worth reading. Uh, Fraser Stoddart, a Nobel laureate, writes, In my long life of 82 years, there has hardly been a day when I felt more sad. Um, they point out that Trump has a distinct anti-science record. He's called climate change a hoax. He pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement. He would give RFK Jr. a big role in his administration, has promised to make it easier to fire specialists such as scientists from the U.S. government if they oppose his political agenda. And so you've got quotes from lots of people here saying, this is going to really change science in the world, right? Which is, is very sad mm -hmm. because, um, you know, people have their reasons for voting whoever they want. And, you know, think about science and public health, which in my opinion is the most important. And to propose a charlatan who is a lawyer with no science knowledge to be in charge of science is just irresponsible. And I can only hope that calmer heads will prevail, but I, I just, knowing the, what has happened before, I just don't know uh, what's going to happen there. I mean, I think one of these guys in Mexico says he favored Trump. He's a scientist because he's the lesser of the evils, which just tells me he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just an idiot. And And someone here says, yeah, I know that he's anti-science, but I want to take care of myself and my family. So, you know, I think this is a driving thing. People are concerned about themselves. And, you know, you need to be less selfish. You need to worry about the world. That's what Daniel says, or, or people write in 
uh, on the on office hours and say, should I be worried about MPOX? I said, you should have been worried already because it's killing people in other countries. We need to have more of this mentality that, you know, the well-being of the world is important to all of us. Whereas Daniel says, we're not safe until everyone is safe. So I think this is a very sad situation. I hope that all the things that he has threatened do not happen, uh, but we'll see. I think we need to uh, um, we need to up our game here at Microbe TV. Uh, we have a listener pick from Jack. Dear Twiv team, I sense that the public is about to be inundated with misinformation about vaccines, and uh-huh. that even many physicians only have a hazy idea about how the FDA approves them. Here's a link to a YouTube video from October 5th, 2020, at a time when the FDA was reviewing the first COVID vaccines. In this video, Howard Balkner, the editor of Chiefs at the time of JAMA, interviewed Peter Marks, director of CBER, the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, about how the FDA handles a vaccine BLA biological license application. The process requires the FDA to review hundreds of thousands of documents. And Jack provides a YouTube link. That's TWIV1167. You can find show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send questions, comments, picks to TWIV at microbe.tv. And remember, in November and December, it's our fundraiser. Help support real science. We're going to need it in the coming years. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Um, you're welcome, and it was a great selection of papers. Uh, I learned a lot from listening, and uh, I hope to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to listen. That's all it takes. That just needs to listen. That's right. You know what? That's half the secret, isn't it? <laughs> if you don't listen, you're not going to learn. Right? Many people listen, choose not just, to listen. They tune you know, out. I, I used to interview students for a medical school, and I had two two kinds. That's all. Just two kinds. The first kind was willing to engage me in a conversation. The second kind was waiting for me to stop talking <laughs> <laughs> so they could tell me how great they were. I mean, and... kind of related to that is <laughs> people say, I hear people say a lot, I'm bored. And I'm just like, bored? How can you be bored? There's so much interesting bored. stuff in the world. There's just no excuse yeah. to be bored. Computer doesn't work. <laughs> there was a, you remember the, the bottle caps that used to have yeah. S- quotes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I That's had right. one stuck on the wall in my office for years. <laughs> Anyone who's bored is not paying attention. That's right. <laughs> is Kathy a... Spindler is oh. professor emerita, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And Brianne Barker is at Drew University Bio Prof Barker on Blue Sky. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. I learned a lot. And now I want to go drive down I-78 and see if I can find <laughs> You want to go see. <laughs> so I, I saw it. And I said, hey, that's me. And then it goes and, and I'm passing it. And it's not got, it didn't cycle around yet to it. You can't just sit still on 78, you know. So, yeah, uh-huh. see if you can catch it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm-hmm.